All right, you're listening to The Audit, presented by IT Audit Labs. I'm Joshua Schmidt, your producer. Today, we're John, joined by John Massey. He's in South Dakota, and he is the uh, technology director at a construction company named Journey. We're happy to have him here today. Thanks for joining us, John. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to call it. We have Nick Mellum and Eric Brown from IT Audit Labs as well. Um, I'd like to start by having you, John, just give us a little background Um what do you do day to day? What's it like working at Journey? And um, where do you kind of brush up against cybersecurity? Yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, day to day at Journey Group, um, my role was added to kind of help them with um, making technology more than just break fix. So I think everybody knows IT to be the, hey, my password doesn't work and I can't get into my laptop, um, those type of things. But really uh, take a look at how we can use technology to our advantage as a construction firm. Um, obviously, over the years, we've moved from paper to digital. And so we have a lot of data as a result. Um, and so kind of how do we do that and continue to enhance technology for more than just break fix. And so day to day, I'm doing everything from uh, managing the infrastructure team. So keeping the break fix going as well as kind of building out a business solutions team to look at um, data, how we use it, how it talks with each other, uh, and then kind of overlaid over both is security around both. How do we protect the data that we have, the systems, the uh, different things that we use. And so that's kind of my day to day and where I brush up against um, info security there at Journey. And John, what what sort of construction work does Journey do? Uh, a little bit of everything, I feel like sometimes. Uh, predominantly, we're in the commercial construction space. We also have an asphalt paving division, a civil division that does civil heavy highway. Uh, and then we also do some specialty work in the food uh, manufacturing and cold storage, as well as and then a residential home building division as well. So a little bit all over the board. Um, but yeah. Typically, um, most people seek us out as like a general contractor. Do you see a lot of different types of cyber attacks or mostly phishing? What, what comes across your organization mostly? Yeah, so for us, um, due to the nature of our work, uh, especially being like a um, commercial general contractor, we have a lot of financially motivated attacks that kind of come against us, whether that's through vishing, phishing, smishing. I think we've had all three kind of come through. Um, we've had your very classic, um, even at our vendor level, looking at, you know, if we get a sudden request to change payment information, vetting that out, um, stopping that, those type of things. Um, so kind of on the cybersecurity front, we're not only looking internally with our users on how do you identify this for things that directly attack us, but maybe even a subcontractor or a vendor or supplier that we work with, maybe they've been compromised, how to even identify those when they're coming through a semi-legitimate method. Um, and then impersonation. So yeah, we have a lot of attempts of, hey, I'm the CEO and I'm asking you to wire this money to so-and-so, you know, kind of following those things as well. So doing a lot of compat with, um, making sure that we're doing everything we can do to help our users identify that stuff. John, I'm curious, what kind of, what kind of training are you guys doing to combat that? Are you doing all before? Do you do social engineering training? What, what are you guys doing to combat that? So we do uh, know before that is a big piece of what we do. Um, and then we actually do quarterly training as well. So we, oh. um, through know before we offer some training that's just outside of your standard, like fishing test um, to kind of keep our, people educated on some of those other risks out there. And then uh, we actually financially motivate them through some gift card drawings and things like that. Like, hey, if you complete your training, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll IT will give you a gift card. So um, that's what we've been doing to kind of do that. And then um, just general user education as well. We've ran some events throughout the year that we kind of try to tie to um, different things. We did some stuff around Christmas with a elf on the shelf. And so we had some cybersecurity things that we were trying to keep people kind of informed and trained on even through that activity. So we're trying to find creative ways to keep it in front of people um, mm -hmm. that maybe aren't always the most um, technologically savvy or technologically open to using the, the tech. And so trying to keep them informed through some maybe non-traditional methods. That's cool. We had uh, another guest on a, a little while ago who was working in cybersecurity for an electrical generation company <laughs> and where you're using the, the carrot or your organization is using the carrot to incentivize people to go to training. Their organization was, was using the stick. And if people <laughs> failed a phishing attempt, uh, the simulated phishing attempts uh, five times, they would be fired. So oh. that's how seriously they took it. 
And I could definitely, you know, depending on the industry, for sure, we're trying to avoid that. We have looked at some maybe escalated scales of if you continue to fail, maybe we're having a more direct conversation with you and your manager (laughs) on uh, safety and security of, um, you know, your IT resources. But uh, no, we found at least so far the carrot method has worked pretty well. um, And uh, we're hoping to avoid the stick method. (laughs) So you're literally training construction workers on best practices, cybersecurity practices, IT tactics, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And it's, um, you know, we, it's an interesting field because you'll have uh, the construction worker that really has like an iPad um, and some connectivity all the way up to an office full of people that are doing all the kind of support services work. So you're more traditional tech users. Um, and so trying to find training and ways to adapt it to each group has been interesting. And then, um, a nice challenge. Like it's been fun and something different than my career where I've typically been dealing with more office folks. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting learning curve, but um, one that I feel like we've kind of done a good job at it getting out there in the field. We can always improve, but yeah, I think um, I've definitely enjoyed that piece of it. So we were talking about AI in the workplace and, and how it's becoming ubiquitous, ubiquitous uh, across all, all industries. But I'm curious to know what, uh, what kind of applications, what tools are being used at Journey? What do you see some of the construction workers using? And, and how's that starting to show up in your day-to-day uh, work activities? For sure. I mean, I think the most common one, ChatGPT, always is a uh, kind of the first out of the gate we also see things like um, Copilot has been a new one we've been kind of looking at, throwing around. What does that look like? Um, a lot of AI note taking. So we have a lot of whether that's through like Zoom calls, those type of things. We'll get a lot of um, AI note taking solutions. Some AI document review, um, whether that's legal contract or construction documents, those kinds of things. Having those reviewed, um, and then for kind of more the office side, we've seen things like beautiful AI for slide deck generations trying to do that to kind of maybe save some time on those fronts. But those have been kind of the pieces of that we've seen so far in construction where um, there's some standalone services. Obviously, a lot of our products now, AI has become quite a buzzword. Um, We do have products that are starting to implement AI within their own products um, that we're looking at and testing. But um, those are kind of the core ones that we've seen so far kind of try to enter our space that are not super construction focused. When you're you're looking at Copilot, are you looking at the internal ver- version of Copilot where it would index the documents that you have in your environment? Or are you really looking at it just externally for uh, the AI search function? Uh, actually, a little bit of both. So one is a controlled, um, you know, how can we deploy a chat GPT style of uh, AI within the organization that they can use for some of that searching where we know if they do put in some of our data, it's protected, but also the, yeah, the, how can we also use it as an internal resource to, um, let it index documents that we have or find company information or make it easier for our users to access data that we have that's traditionally stored in flat files that you're having to know what you're searching for essentially. Yeah. Just, I think it was last week I had a demo on Copilot. Um, at uh, one of our clients and, you know, it does all the cool things here as you're talking about indexing data. One of the little things I thought was cool is the email plugin and it will like actively learns your writing style and how you sound. They were demoing this and, you know, you put in a few keywords and it spits out a scholarly email. Uh, so it's just like the little things like that, that I really has me excited. Yeah. We've found like, um, it's interesting. A lot of us use the copilot summary. Um, so sometimes, especially, when you're dealing with outside parties, we end up with these really long email strings and then suddenly 50 emails deep, you get added. <laughs> and so it's like, hey. that kind of tied up with March Madness. And so uh, our CFO used uh, Copilot to write some of the messages out to the team. Um, and so it used a lot of like basketball puns um, it was just funny. And so um, we've enjoyed kind of playing around even with that to write some maybe more engaging emails versus like a standard, hey, we're doing this promotion and we're trying to save money. So here's a thing you can do to submit your ideas. And it was um, gave it much more of a marketing flair without having to actually have somebody kind of write the copy for it. So that was kind of fun. Awesome. So um, can you describe some of the experiences of developing some organizational standards? Um 
you know, can maybe you can give us a story on how something came up that you had to address or or uh, how something showed up as a threat um, that needed to be need to be squashed. AI, it's interesting in this role, as well as my previous one, um, it chat GPT kind of took off and suddenly everyone wanted to use it and everyone wanted to um, use the public version of it. And what did that mean? And so um, <clears throat> in my last role, we kind of formed an AI security council that I led and um, we talked through, okay, um, I was previously in the financial services world. So it's like, what does this mean? You know, how can we prevent um, customer information, PII, those type of things of kind of coming in. Um, and we work to say, okay, well, first we just have to come up with a policy. We can figure out ways to enforce, but some of it is just basic user education. Here's what we know exists today. Here's why maybe we wouldn't want you to use certain services. Here's what we would approve of. Um, and then really encouraging people that we would listen to. Um, if you have an AI idea, AI idea, um, <laughs> that we would listen and hear you out and investigate and look for the pitfalls and have legal and compliance really go through a deep dive of the terms of service <laughs> to figure out where's our data going? How's it being used? Um, is it being used for learning? Is it just learning within our org? Um, you know, and then the output. So what happens with that output? Is that something you can reuse? Or will you give it to someone else? Is it ours? Is it yours technically? All those type of things. And so we began to kind of bridge it up with user education, but begin to build a policy just to say, hey, as a reminder, you know, this isn't just a glorified search engine. Um, when you put things in there, especially the public version of ChatGPT, um, that's retained. And so we can't be, here's all the things that you need to think about. And so we were also teaching users how to write prompts. So instead of saying like, my company name is looking to do this kind of policy, we genericize it. So a financial company looking to write a policy on X, what would that look like? And have it kind of generate those things. And then teaching people trust but verify. We had several cases that we pulled um, from, or stories, one was a legal case, of just how AI um, hallucinates, how people believe hallucinations, how far that goes. And so teaching our users that you know, you can use these tools and whatever they produce still needs a human element of um, review before put into any type of production or um, put into play within a procedure or document or something like that. And so um, that's how we began to build our policy on how we use things. We did some of the like uh, standard, we tried to block as much as we can on a corporate network, but between phones and everything else, there's only so much you can really block. So it was more of a, we know the technology is out there. Let's try and teach our people best way to use it um, and define for them in a policy what that looks like. To me, I kind of draw the connection between, we, you know, when COVID started, everybody was work from home, right? And we had to like scramble, right? Everybody was scrambling. And it, to me, the, the AI discussion is kind of the same thing, right? People are getting pushed. Users are using it all over your organization. And we're having the AI conversation with, you know, different clients and everybody's scrambling to educate and create a policy. But it's really cool to hear you guys have just kind of pulled your bootstraps up and you're already going down the road, you know, creating those policies and teaching your, uh, you know, your people all across the organization best practices. And I, I think it's it's rare that we've been seeing that, you know. Right now, people aren't having really having the conversation and people are still using the tools, very powerful like Copilot, um, and they definitely have a need. So it's really cool to hear what all the things you guys are doing. Yeah. And, and John, as you look at the, the administrative controls or the policy, there's also technical controls and then physical controls, of course, that we look at from an information security perspective. So you, you've gotten a start on the administrative controls of creating that policy that gives the guidelines, almost the the uh, speed limit, if you will, for the users. And then there's the the technical control side or the enforcement piece. Have you gone down that road yet to to determine if there are tools that you could use to check and, and audit to see how people are leveraging AI in the environment? We've started exploring that to see kind of what's out there. Um, Part of that effort is also some more advanced data loss prevention items to either keep things where they should be or prevent it from being able to be sent. Um, so that's a piece of it. And then, yeah, trying to look at different ways to 
capture usage. Um, thankfully, pretty much our data is contained to company devices. Um, we've got a lot in place to keep that in line. So we do have some control of what we see going in and out from the devices, um, web traffic apps, those kinds of things. Um, and so we can um, kind of keep a pulse on that to some degree. Obviously, when you're dealing with, we maybe have a meeting with someone else, they host the meeting, they're using AI. There's only so much we can kind of control on that front. But um, for us, um, we've started to do that. I would say kind of unique maybe to construction is we don't have as many technologically savvy users. So they're not necessarily always going out to, they're like, hey, I use these six things on my iPad and that's the six things I will always use until you tell me different. <laughs> um, so I do have a little bit of advantage there, but um, for us, I think it's a lot of the um, office staff or maybe the more technically savvy staff that's looking for ways to improve their workflow, which I think AI is doing a great job for us as far as um, finding some of those efficiencies, but just making sure they use them safely. So we've tried to make sure that there's an open dialogue between technology and the end user. So they feel comfortable to approach us first before maybe diving feet first into an AI solution um, as kind of just a more of a, we'll call it human firewall um, approach to say, hey, we'll hear you out. We'll listen to you. We're not here to tell you no right out the gate or to just spew out a policy that says, well, you know, you can't do this. You may have a very legitimate use case. We just want to help you investigate it to make sure you're kind of looking at it from all angles. AI in particular is an interesting problem to wrestle with because a lot of it depends on the maturity of the organization that's implementing it. If you're in an organization that's lower on the maturity side and they don't even have policy rolled out, it's really hard to come out and say, well, yeah, you shouldn't use AI, but there's no guidelines for those users as a backstop to say, well, here's our policy, this is our corporate standard, this is why you shouldn't use it. Um, so it sounds like your organization is a little bit more mature where you have policies and, and you have a way to deliver policy, educate users, train users, and there's that almost a feedback mechanism where you can introduce something new, get feedback from the users and, and make it really applicable to your organization. So kudos on you for doing that. Thanks has been a let's investigate, let's try things in a sandbox, let's look and do the review um, and let's keep it rolling and moving forward and trying to stay on the front forefront of it versus the um, we're continually trying to catch with it. So because um, we do feel that I think in the next few years, I mean, you're already starting to see it, but it'll just continue to grow. So we wanted to make sure that we're trying to build a good foundation before it gets out of hand. John, kind of curious with you know, you, you said you're you're encouraging staff to come and, you know, show their use case, their business applications. Is there any one you could comment on a, a cool idea, you know, how they're using it? You know, something that we might have thought about. Is there anything you could comment on? Um, the beautiful AI was one that was brought to us. Um, we do a lot of presentation work, whether that is um, to customers for potential new projects or even internally amongst different teams of um, kind of presenting information. So it was brought to us, hey, can we look at beautiful AI? I can put kind of my outline into it. It actually produces really nice presentations that I have to just do some modifications to, but saves me time. Um, so that's been a pretty big one. Um, and then Copilot, it was kind of a joint thing. I had started looking at it as Microsoft was um, beginning to promote it. We were getting people out in the field as well that were asking for Copilot from like a um, data analysis view. So being able to take Excel tables and do some analysis against them. Um, or doing um, more consolidated summaries. So getting a bunch of data from uh, end users and being able to take those documents, and say, hey, summarize this for me um, to save some time. And so those are kind of, while not super exciting, but they have been use cases that this was stuff that people was either rekeying, they were doing themselves, that now they're taking Copilot and um, or Beautiful AI and producing pretty succinct presentations or summary docs too, which is yeah, nice. really, really necessary functions. We, I was working with a client uh, pretty recently and we were having the AI discussion and they brought up a really cool uh, idea or one they're actively using. And it was for a 911 call center and they uh, suffer a very high attrition rate, right? They have a bunch of in and out, people in and out and a high turnover, I should say. 
And uh, they were building out AI to query how to's, right? Like, so you're actively on a 911 call, they can key in a couple of keywords and it'll bring up like, oh, this is what you do in the situation or some of that you might not know what to do quickly on an emergency call. And this, it was able to query all these data sets that they've already built, right? That they have laying around essentially, and they can jump through it really quickly. So it was really helping somebody new on the desk taking active phone calls to speed up that process. So that, that was kind of why I was asking kind of the, what you guys are seeing because, you know, right, this is kind of a, that new frontier. How are other people using it that maybe we haven't thought about it? So just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the longer term stuff we're looking at is um, in the construction industry, we have tons of documents, um, whether that's drawings, um, plan specs, those kinds of things that go into a project. Um, is today, if I need to find something, I'm scrolling through what could be tens of twenties of documents trying to find this answer is finding a tool or a way that we can now consolidate that to let um, people ask in that natural language, a few words of just, Hey, I'm looking for the paint spec on this project. And it provides you that answer um, to save some time, like on the project management or project engineer side. Um, and I think also from a contract compliance sometimes as well, you know, um, are we within spec of our delivery date? Are we doing this? Is it slipping? Um, using AI to kind of maybe combine some pieces of data to look at that and maybe give us um, proactive answers to let us maybe catch things before we would typically see them. Um, and so, yeah, those are kind of the use cases that we see pretty quickly coming up of um, and that we're kind of exploring is how can we get our data in a way that um, AI can index it and then present it back to us in a way that lets maybe a newer project manager or someone new to journey group um, maybe not knowing our standards or the way we do something instead of having to ask around can literally ask um, a bot style chat to say, Hey, I'm looking for this. And it provides it plus the evidence to back it up. And they get it right away. They don't have to wait for that email back. It's right at their fingertips. Yes. Yeah. Really cool. Years ago, maybe, maybe 10 years or so ago, I was working with an organization that had a, a really large healthcare uh, company as a, as a client um, and that healthcare company in their Skunk Works team, they were working on an AI project that could listen into intake phone calls. And allegedly, they could determine within 30 seconds if a person had a high likelihood of having Alzheimer's just by the, the conversation. Um, so, it, and, and this was like a precursor to, to really AI being mainstream. So it's, it's kind of neat to hear the, the types of things that are now coming to the forefront with all of the different AI mechanisms. You, you mentioned beautiful AI around presentation, uh, images and, and, um, creating those PowerPoints. There's mid journey, which you can text input, uh, prompts, and it'll create an image based on the, the, the text that you put in. Uh, but as all of those come together, they're still trying to figure out governance because the, the, the deep fakes are really good now. And, and deep fakes as moving images with sound are, are a thing. So you could create this deep fake of maybe a politician if the guardrails weren't in place saying something that that person never really even said. Um, so I, as, as a society, as we're becoming more aware of AI coming online, being able to recognize that even something that we couldn't spot was a deep fake potentially could be. And I, I, I just, I wonder where we're going to be in the next 10 years as technology and AI is just integrated into our lives. Um, everything from security camera footage of detecting whether or not somebody had a weapon on them, for instance, um, to something like sampling a voice and recreating that that voice without that person even being aware. Yeah, it's actually something I was thinking about um, this week as I saw OpenAI announce their vocal generation service that can essentially take and regenerate and the samples that I listened to from the original um, to what was generated and then... I think impressive to me generated in different languages even um, was very cool, but maybe a little scary of wondering, you know, how will we be able to begin to know when something is genuine and when something has been AI generated 
um, becomes increasingly, increasingly harder. So yeah, I'm curious to see as a society where we'll end up um, how you know something is truly verified versus a deep fake. Governing AI is turning into like trying to herd cats. It's like <laughs> For sure. difficult, difficult to do. Shout out to Eric on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you beat him to it this time. We have a running joke about uh, Nick's, Nick's <laughs> herd of cats. Yeah. I, one suggestion that I've seen um, kind of been floated out there is to put some sort of a watermark on the data or some sort of a watermark embedded into the content somehow where you could use another tool or potentially another AI tool to detect the AI generate. I don't know if it's a great idea using AI to detect AI. Sounds like a conflict of uh, <laughs> interest in Skynet style. Um, where I've seen it in my career, the so music generation, right? Um, it kind of started out very, very cool and, and very like helpful. You know, I'm using my keyboards here to generate what we call MIDI. It's basically ones and zeros on a key roll. So I could turn this into a flute or, 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 or a drum, for example. And um, one of the recent advancements that's been really helpful is it, it will generate a whole track of drums, for example, for, um, you know, using a MIDI generator. It's kind of an AI. You can kind of massage it into this is the chorus. This is the verse. Let's, this part is more quiet. This part's louder. Um, so that was super helpful. But now we're at the point even just I think it's been well, it's been certainly less than 10 years. It's probably more in the range of five years where I just heard a, a text to, to generated from text to to audio an old Delta blues style sounding track where, you know, I've been a guitar player for 30 years now. I would not have been able to tell. And not only did it have guitar playing, it had singing in it. It sounded authentic. And not only that, it had the whole uh, vibe of the era, right? So it was sounding like it was recorded maybe like the forties um, where the quality is really low and the, and the, and the frequency range is very limited. You know, you're, it's kind of sounding muffly. And then even just down to the artifacts on the audio, like, you know, crackling, you know, and some of the some of the cloudiness. So um, I just recently saw a news article that said Billie Eilish and Greta Van Fleet and 200 other artists have signed a petition that they want, uh, you know, responsible AI practices in music. Because the fear is this is going to come out and replace a lot of creative work. I'm, I'm curious, um, from your perspective, John, you know, what are some of the key uh, factors organizations sh should consider or industries should consider when developing these kinds of standards um, as it relates to your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of it is, um, just like you mentioned, one is um, if you're using AI and it does generate something, where does that intellectual property really lie? Is it yours? Is it technically the AI still? Do they still retain rights to it? Um, I think that's a big piece um, as you're looking at these things, depending on what industry you're in. Um, I think um, that whole knowledge of what goes into AI um, and are you okay with that information leaving can maybe your control in, a lot, in some cases, um, kind of keeping that in line. Um, and then um, really education. I think a lot of companies that at least as I've talked to some peers and other people just in the marketplace is um, we don't really know what to do with AI. So if we just don't talk about it um, or we just kind of say a one liner of like, don't use chat GPT, um, <laughs> that that's enough. Um, and really realizing that, yeah, you're, you're really just creating shadow IT and then people are just going to try to do it on their own. So instead get out in front of it and just say, even if it, even if the answer is, Hey, we know it's new, it's emerging. It changes pretty much day to day now. Um, how we're, we're doing our best to kind of keep in front of it. But here's, as a company, this is kind of where we're, at least we're starting and know that we might change it in three or six months or whenever, but it's continually evolving. We're continually keeping the pulse on it, but we are aware and, you know, this is how we want to work with it, whatever kind of their risk tolerance is. Yeah, it sounds like there's a balance between, you know, the innovation needed to stay competitive um, versus organizational standards to keep you secure, right? I mean, that's kind of... That's kind of the name of the game with cybersecurity. Am I wrong? No, you're totally correct. And I think for us, you know, um, and those I've talked to, I think that are a little more forward thinking with AI. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, is this replacing my job? Like, is this, is, you know, yeah. and it's like, no, but we do believe that, you know, humans and companies that choose to embrace AI are going to be the ones that succeed and maybe survive versus the, um, 
no, nah, we're just going to stick our head in the sand and we're going to keep doing what we do. And we're, AI is just going to be a thing and we're not going to look at it. And so um, even in the construction space, I mean, it is a hotly um, talked about topic in some of the user communities and groups that are not necessarily technology focused that I participate in um, is what is AI doing to the construction industry and how can we be adopters of it versus um, just saying, hey, we're going to keep doing what we do because we think that as humans, we can do it better and without AI. And um, a lot of comparison has been given to the good old uh, blockbuster versus Netflix um, type of thing of you're going to probably end up being the blockbuster companies that choose to just ignore AI versus the Netflix who choose to embrace it and kind of move forward. That That's a great, great point, John. One thing I was just thinking about of use cases in construction with AI is, you know, different cities and counties have different codes, right? Different building codes. And, you know, depending on where you're building, if it's commercial, residential, you name a, a you know, multitude of different areas you guys are successful. And, you know, maybe one good use case could be quickly finding out what the code is for that area, you know, type in a code, type in the area you're in and boom, the, the general contractor, they have that information. So the, yeah, just so many things you can do with it, but you know, what your, your comment before, it sounds like the two main things that you guys are really striving for is education, policy and procedure, like get out in front of it, educate the staff, and then have those documents to, you know, back you guys, but then to keep the data secure by having that document to show, you know, the workers in your fleet. Totally. And yeah, there's a lot. I think um, construction has so much that is was paper driven that just became digital, um, which is great because it is it is very indexable data. And I think, yeah, the use case that use um, there is actually a company out there that is working on that. Oh, cool. um, so you can even upload your construction documents. They compare it to the local code and then tell you um, here's where you're going to need to maybe make a modification or um, do a change order to be in code with where you're building in. Um, and then, yeah, I think in our space, we've also seen um, maybe some potential for um, like on the mid journey side, like image generation. So being able to maybe more quickly build some conceptual models for people and seeing how we can do that and then use that in conjunction with making quicker changes. So, Hey, what if I, as an owner want to look and see what it would it look like if I did this or what if I did this? Um, is being able to build some of those scenarios faster without having to have a person build a whole full 3D model and show it them. We can maybe um, use AI to generate some of those. So even those type of things, I think, are being explored in construction. But yeah, there seems to be um, a ton of use cases and the industry is pretty ripe for it in construction um, to do that. Yeah, it, and you, you mentioned before, like people are maybe worried that their job could be could be lost to this technology but you know maybe the conversation could be flipped to well you use the word streamline but really like you know along with streamline we're we're trying to make the job we're trying to provide you with this tool that's so powerful to make you more successful right so maybe you have a bigger bandwidth to do a, a better job or have lower stress right or you know along with doing a job maybe you can do more right and be successful be a, more of an add to the company as well so there's a lot of different ways like you're saying that this, that AI can make somebody successful in their career field, wherever that is. What would be some of the tools or th some of the things you're seeing implemented that, you know, expedite, you know, kind of arduous processes or designing things? Where is that showing up um, that's really speeding up the workflow? Um, we're pretty much, we're in the infancy of some of it, but we're in use case, I can tell you, um, we had a situation where a particular company we were working with um, for some reason required us to have a policy on overwater, underwater oil drilling. We don't do that. Um, therefore, we don't have a policy for it, but we had to provide a policy someone had to write. Um, so normally, if we didn't have AI, we would have gone to our legal and risk team. We would have had them research it. They would have put together a policy, even if it was a short one pager, just to say, we don't really do it. Here's what we would do if we did it, but we don't. Here you go. Um, we actually used AI to help build the first draft of that document. So we were like, this is what they're asking for based on this code. Help us write a policy that essentially says we don't do this. Um, and AI generated it, legal then tweaked it, reviewed it, and then that became part of it. So what was probably a several hour long um, process became like an hour meeting that was and it was done by the end. And so those are um, some of the large language model generation stuff is where we're seeing some of that pickup today, 
some of the responses we have to do, we can use large language model to um, draft responses, those kinds of things. Um, so it's pretty early on in our stages, but that's kind of where we're seeing some of that to start pay off even quickly is just some of those basic um, tasks that we would normally do ourselves and that are now kind of reduced down to maybe a meeting or 30 minutes. Performance reviews are another good use case for those because <laughs> most companies have them. Nobody likes to write them. Nobody likes to give them complete waste of time. So you can throw that right into the AI <laughs> and set it done couple edits afterwards and you're good to go. See, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> um, selfishly, I also use it for a lot of vendor responses. Oh yeah. Um, larger company, we do get solicited a lot. And um, and so sometimes I use AI to help me um, draft responses or pull out key points that I want to uh, highlight or use. Um, we just went through a software selection process for one of our groups. Um, and so I had chains and strings of email from three different vendors from demos to questions we asked and responses. Um, and I used Copilot to actually help pull those together into summaries, help us do some analysis on product comparison between them um, for us to kind of come to a selection. So yeah, we um, some of that tedious stuff like that, that we try and um, we're trying to find ways to remind ourselves like, hey, we have some AI that can actually help with it. And it actually has proven helpful, which is nice. We were talking with uh, with somebody a couple of weeks ago on solar and um, the tie-in to the grid and the, the, the current county policies, ordinances, what have you, around how you could feed power back into the grid if you were generating your own power. And, and it, it seems to be almost a city-by-city uh, governance around their interpretations of maybe state and federal laws. So I could really see AI um, providing that streamlined view rather than the human inspector interpreting the law that says, well, no, you, th these batteries have to be eight inches from the, uh, you know, the wall or from each other for fire protection or, or whatever that was. That, that person's getting that information from somewhere. And I think halfway through the project, the story that I was hearing was that the numbers somehow had changed and uh, a portion of the project had to be redone, which was costly and, and probably not really adding any value to the, to the customer. Mm. Uh, but being able to have that AI essentially as that intermediary, and, and, I, and I think you were mentioning that there was some of that AI already in place or at its infancy to be able to take designs and maybe press them against standards to, to ensure that you're doing the right thing before you even start the project. Yeah, uh, especially in construction, rework or what we would call rework is um, is big. Obviously, as a GC, you're eating that cost mm -hmm. um, to go back. And so trying to compare a lot of that to, yeah, local ordinances, um, making sure your plans are within spec of them um, and doing as much as you can to prevent rework. I think not only, I mean, just obviously helps you as a company from a financial performance, but also helps from a um, relationship with your owner or your customer that you're building for um, to not have to be the bearer of bad news to come back in the middle of a project and say, actually, I need to change this now and there's cost associated or time delay. Um, but building better customer relationship as a result. And so um, we hope to see more of that. Um, South Dakota, as much as I love them, we do have, I think, um, probably some counties that still have a lot on, in a book uh, that's on paper. So some of our challenges maybe in this part of the country will be more um, digital access to that type of information. Um, but in the larger metros that we build in, um, those are digitally available. And so um, I'm hoping to see more of that kind of evolve of yeah, how can we run things through and maybe check for this before sure. we ever get started? And I'm, I'm just thinking here in the Twin Cities with, with Target um, and the work that they were doing to uh, refine who their target customer was and then market to their target customer. And this goes back a few years. I, I think it was in the early 2010s where they, they had an analyst on their team, Andrew Poole, I believe was his name and or is his name and, and he created an algorithm of sorts that would be able to ingest information that target was collecting on its customers based on potentially where those customers move throughout the store their patterns of buying and they were able to really create a persona 
for that person and, and, and really truly know that what influenced that person and, and target at the time. I'm not sure if it's still the same, but expecting mothers are were targets um, primary target customer because they, they want to get that person before they have the baby and they're buying all of that, you know, the, the pre baby stuff. And then certainly um, after they have the child, all of the, the things that go along with it, formula, diapers, what have you. So being able to identify who was going to become a parent and then a, in particular a female parent, and then go after that person specifically. And, and I think the, the way the story went with the, the work that Andrew had done was to be able to determine that there was a person who um, was going to become um, a parent and they, they sent them targeted advertising. Well, the, the person was still living at home under the age of 18, I believe, and the, uh, the, the, the person's father was getting the mail and they saw these flyers that were addressed um, to the young woman and it was, you know, Target flyers focused on baby things. So he went into Target and said, why are you sending my daughter these things? Well, it turns out his daughter was pregnant. He didn't know about it. And the, the, the Target formula was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. As I understand what they've done is they've just tweaked the advertising so that it's maybe not, not all just uh, the, the focused content in this case of, of, of baby related things. Maybe it's baby related things, but then there's other content around that so that when you're just looking at it, it doesn't stand out to you. But if you're the person being marketed to, then it, it would resonate with you. Um, so that and this is going back again before the large language model AI was really um, in the public space. But I think companies have been tinkering with this for years and those companies that are um you know, high revenue companies are probably already doing this and have worked it into their algorithms to market to us. Oh, I would completely agree. I know of, uh, I have seen a couple of instances of uh, predictive AI in that type of piece, whether it is um, used to target an end user or um, in some cases um, being used for um, predicting project um, viability or um, profitability. Um, so being able to take past data and see if a similar project, what would be our change orders, what would be pitfalls, what would be things that are most likely to occur just based on past data um, has been something that's interesting. And I think um, with as much as things can be tracked now with data, um, I mean, we do almost pretty much everything digitally now, um, using AI to be able to crunch that faster and look at, yeah, predictive analysis or um, picking out people, projects, things that um, may be harder to have done in the past will become very commonplace. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see stuff that was only reachable by like the targets of the world um, coming down to more of the mid market that now we have access to um, cost effective AI technology that can do the same for us and what that'll change for kind of that mid um, market space of business will be interesting to see in the kind of the next five to 10 years, I think. So what kind of strategies do you employ to keep your business up to date? If these things are changing so fast, um, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some talk around, you know, you had mentioned, you know, you do quarterly, quarterly meetings or, or quarterly educational experiences for the staff. Um, what are some of the other, other strategies you guys like to use? I know for us, I mean, we have a group internally that kind of looks over and is, um, talking about AI. So we're all in our own ways trying to keep pulse on it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of an ever evolving thing. And it's something that um, is being talked about more and more levels. It's no longer, I would say I've seen a pretty big shift even after the first of the year of it's no longer just a technology topic. Um, more is being marketed to CEOs, other C-level executives, the mid-management level. Um, whereas I feel like prior, maybe even to the beginning of this year, it's still kind of held out in the IT space. Um, and now I'm you know, I'm getting messages from my CEO that's like, hey, I got this email from this group that I work with and they're talking about AI. Is this something you want to attend or should I attend it and learn about it? And so um, it's just interesting to see even how it's 
we're trying to keep a policy even how that's kind of changing and where information is being given out that way as well. Um, and so that's kind of how we're kind of taking a multi-level approach on how we keep up to date with what's going on. Um, and then even we look at, um, yeah, and then even higher education as well, um, seeing what they're doing at the higher ed level, um, what exists out there. Um, and so just kind of trying to attack it from multiple different angles. Um, so we kind of know where we stand in the marketplace. Yeah, I know. I know you all deal with this on some level. The communication is is a key aspect to kind of um, making sure your whole team is aware. And we've talked about procedures and policies a lot. Um, maybe, you know, we could do popcorn style. I know you probably could all commiserate on the challenges of, you know, working with diverse groups of people that tend to glaze over when you start going into the tech talk. Um, maybe we could just go around and just give some like pointers on um, when you're working with an organization, how do you keep the communication fresh other than just loading up the schedule with more meetings? Cause I know how much we all love to attend an extra meeting every week. Yeah, Josh, that's great. I think one key thing that I've talked to some organ organizations about, and this doesn't just have to be for the AI topic, but for education, it's it could be a newsletter, right? That goes out maybe once a month or every other week, something like that with tidbits of new information, recent issues for attacks or phishing emails. Um, you could have one targeted towards AI, maybe what we're doing. Hey, this is the use case that, you know, so-and-so used, um, to help them, you know, with this project or whatever of safe uses for AI. Uh, but I think the power of a newsletter, because a lot of people, you know, tend to use that or read that, um, they maybe get it on a Friday morning, Friday afternoon or whatever it is, some light reading, hey, take a, take part in this. And uh, John um, commented on it before, they were giving out gift cards, right? Maybe you read to the end, do you comment or give us your take on this? You get a $5 gift card to Caribou Coffee, Starbucks or whatever it is. Um, but uh, I, th I think for me that that's it. The the quick quick advice really is you know to get out in front of everybody. But I think a newsletter um, you don't have to hurt everybody um, into a room and um, you know death by PowerPoint. But it could be a quick quick hit uh, newsletter. Put Nick down for the newsletter. What what do you like to use? Eric? <laughs> What's your favorite strategy? You, you know, just kind of extrapolating what what Nick said. I. I think the future is delivering content to people in a way that they would best absorb the content. So some people might be visual, some might be audio, some might want to read the content and leveraging AI technologies like HeyGen, which can essentially make a talking head and, and take uh, text input and turn it into human voice uh, along with animation it is pretty cool. But I, I really think the, the way in which we want to deliver important content like security training, for example, is to leverage AI to deliver that content in a way that would resonate most and be most impactful. So I, I don't know that we're there yet. I, I, there, there's technologies that, that do all of the things maybe a little bit differently, but I don't think we have a platform yet. And, and maybe with something like... Um, uh, the Bing's platform where um, uh, Copilot, where you can essentially index your organization if uh, Copilot's able to index the, the, the team's communications that people have, the email communication they have, and if they're doing voice content over Teams, potentially being able to absorb and translate that, that audio conversation, you're going to have a really good understanding of that person in their work environment, how they like to be communicated with, and potentially we'd be able to deliver that in a way that resonates with them. And, you know, we're probably three to five years off from that if things go along the current trajectory. And I would agree. I think um, kind of along both of those lines is meeting people where they are. I think that's the best success we've had. Um, so sometimes we may today, because of yeah the lack of that kind of platform or technology, we may be triplicating some of what we do. But um, we do try to look for ways to um, instead of what maybe was more traditional of like saying, hey, we're either going to have death by PowerPoint or I'm just going to email you um, a different Word doc every week of here's the new policy we have of trying to find more creative ways of, yeah, whether that's a video or um, we've even done events like hey, we're going to have donuts with IT in the central part of the thing, and you're going to show up, and I'm going to give you kind of an informal talk for 15 minutes on 
this important topic, um, trying to just do different things to meet people um, where they are and where they learn best. Um, and I think we're even just outside of AI, we're trying to do that as a whole organization. Um, but yeah, I think that has proven effective is trying to not just assume that one way of communicating is going to be the best for everyone. Um, but has, yeah, I would kind of go with that as far as a, um, a good way of trying to meet people where they are. If you want to meet me where I'm at, you can just offer free beer, you know, pizza, <laughs> pizza works, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, free beer is usually a good one. Podcast is another great way to communicate with people. Uh, we've been uh, we've been getting a little on the comments section. So if you have anything you'd like to add, hit us up in the comments section on YouTube. Like and subscribe if you want more of the content that we're providing here on the audit. Big thanks for John Massey for coming on today. Uh, shout out to South Dakota Midwest. Um, <laughs> once again, Nick Mellon, Eric Brown, thanks for your time. You've been listening to the audit. Yeah, Josh, one other thing I, I think Nick was talking about getting a third cat. So maybe in the comments, if people want to come up with a name for the cat, <laughs> yeah. that might be, uh, might be good. A cat centric episode. <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening to the audit presented by it audit labs. We are experts at assessing risk and compliance while providing administrative and technical controls to improve our clients' data security. Our threat assessments find the soft spots before the bad guys do, identifying likelihood and impact, while all our security control assessments rank the level of maturity relative to the size of your organization. Thanks to our devoted listeners and followers, as well as our producer, Joshua J. Schmidt, and our audio video editor, Cameron Hill. You can stay up to date on the latest cybersecurity topics by giving us a like and a follow on our socials and subscribing to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you source your security content. 